must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. This is your host, Brandon Poen, and today I'm joined by three incredibly special guests to talk a little bit more about telehealth, whether it not being a core competency within DPT education, as, as I'm sure a lot of listeners know that um, this was the main topic of debate at the 2019 ELC Oxford debate. Um, we, of course, had the pro team on to talk about their perspective and make their points. But we, of course, being our show, always wanting to represent both sides. Um, we wanted to have, of course, the con team as well. Um, better known, of course, if you were at the debate as the Teletubbies team. Um, so with that, I'm very happy to welcome doctors Nancy Kirsch, David Taylor, and Tanya Wilkinson. So thank you all so much again for all that you do. I know there's a lot more that you do um, apart from you know, of course, everything related to this debate, and there's a lot more into this. Um, But before we kind of dive into this topic regarding telehealth, um, would you guys be willing to kind of just go through a brief intro into kind of who you each are, what was your story and how you got into education, and kind of how you kind of got into this Oxford debate topic regarding telehealth and kind of how you got into that avenue, if you wouldn't mind. So, uh, Nancy, how about we start with you? All righty. So, um, I kind of fell into education, I think. It wasn't a a plan by any means. Uh, I was in clinical practice, still in in clinical practice, Uh, but I had a private practice. Uh, I was working in a hospital and then, you know, uh, did a little bit of uh, PT education and then went into private practice and did a little bit more and then eventually became full-time on the faculty with a little less clinical practice. Um, So... I'm not exactly sure how I got selected to be, um, maybe I looked like a Teletubby. I'm not exactly sure why I I got selected to uh, be part of the debate. Um, We didn't get to select our side, uh, but I was really happy to be on the con side and we'll explain why uh, as this goes on. Um, But that's, that's basically my, uh, my interest and, uh, both in, in education and clinic. Very good. Dave, how about you? So uh, I came to, to education sort of slowly in the uh, guest lecturing part. I, I started my career in a large teaching hospital, so got an appreciation for the uh, education as went on from there. Uh, I was sort of willing to teach whatever people needed help with at the time. I was like the, the Mikey of uh, education, I guess, when I started. Uh, Bruce Greenfield, who's at Emory, is one of my mentor, always joked that if they needed someone to teach algebra, Dave would go to the college and do it. Uh, <laughs> he'd figure it out, uh, even though math is not my strength. But uh, went the adjunct route and then finally was uh, decided to make the jump into full-time education. And then my background uh, from a clinical practice standpoint is geriatric. So I was fortunate that uh, there was a need for someone with a geriatric content expertise uh, at the program I'm at now. And I've sort of driven that ever since. And then that evolved into my role in uh, clinical education, which is still that bridging that didactic teaching and the clinical teaching part. So that's how I got here. As far as the Oxford debate, uh, I I was asked, I think I've uh, been active in the APTA House of Delegates. So I'm not necessarily shy when it comes to getting up and talking at a microphone about about an issue one way or the other. So I was uh, fortunate to be on such a great team at this year's ELC. 
Well, fantastic. And Tana, last but certainly not least. Well, I didn't venture too far from the academic environment after graduation and found myself kind of working in a a major pediatric hospital, but staying tied back to um, the academic environment as a lab instructor. So kind of the journey to education started not too terribly long after um, graduation. We're not going to discuss the years um, either about that. but brought me back in and when an an opportunity came open for a full-time position that was really um, ingrained in clinical education, I just jumped for the opportunity and been full-time since. Uh, So as far as looking at why and how I got involved, I I kind of, I'm just like Nancy, not really sure looking back. It is uh, something like this, unlike Dave, is very much out of my comfort zone. Um, I think Lala's mask was helpful in concealing my identity to get through that, but uh, it was definitely a a fun journey and uh, a good community to be part of. Well, I appreciate it because I always find it's fascinating hearing when we have various guests on, especially that are educators, all their very unique stories and pathways and how they got to where they are. So I always appreciate it when people highlight that and share that journey. Um, But before we kind of get formally into kind of the nitty gritty of telehealth, I think it's always good that we kind of start with kind of as a refresher to listeners, um, what exactly we mean by telehealth. So let's start off with establishing um, a clear and widely accepted definition of what telehealth actually is, um, just to kind of frame the discussion for this. So how do we currently define telehealth? Well, I'll start with that one. So I I look back at uh, Alan Lee's paper that Alan lays it out uh, very well. Uh, But basically, it's just a a broad term that's using electronic information uh, and telecommunications technologies that support healthcare, uh, whether that's clinical patient care, healthcare education, uh, or administration. And then I think the other important aspect is that when we talk about telehealth and telerehabilitation, we're really talking about synonymous, uh, synonymous terms. Right, and, and I would add to that <clears throat> the, the importance of understanding that it is another way in which we deliver care. So we deliver care in a lot of different venues. Um, you know, we just mentioned in our backgrounds a few different venues that we delivered care in over our careers. So it's important to remember that it is a venue in which we deliver care. Uh, it doesn't change the obligations of that care. It doesn't change the importance of integrity in that care. Uh, it speaks to all of those things. Well, perfect. Well, I appreciate that because I think getting that clear definition is always important. And, you know, before we kind of get into um, thoughts on and challenges regarding making telehealth a core competency, I kind of always want to kind of figure like kind of as you had kind of just said in your answer as well, Nancy, and it's how it's a different way um, to kind of do the same thing. So how, and as you guys see it, how should DPT programs continue to integrate changes in technology, like whether that be telehealth or other payment models um, into their core curriculum as a means to um, enhance content delivery or kind of various things to help continue to provide a quality educational experience to students? Well, I think this is the, the crux of what we do in education is constantly weighing the importance of what are the core competencies that we need to have and that people need to have when they graduate, along with the fact that this is a constantly evolving, very dynamic, uh, exciting field to be in. And we want to make sure that anybody that we graduate is at the cutting edge of what's happening in the field, but also has the skill set to be able to be a competent practitioner. So that's something that all of us in education weigh constantly um, the, the juxtaposition of integrating the new with what needs to be the established and uh, taking out maybe a couple of things that aren't so necessary anymore. Yeah, and I think as, as Nancy mentions how much, you know, technology is constantly evolving. So forward thinking has to happen, but forward thinking can only happen to a certain extent. So preparing students and graduates in certain core competencies, but also preparing them for that transformation that happens and being able to navigate and problem solve through those things that will change inevitably, I think is also essential to develop that ability. Yeah, and as we look at our you know, respective curricula, I think every program we have our standards and we're gonna deliver elements that a competent physical therapist should be able to uh, 
uh, do professional behavior skills upon graduation from any of our programs, but how we can look at our each individual curricula and then integrate this service delivery method into those specific things, and then match that up with what students see in clinical practice, because there's that, uh, Nancy talked about this in our, our debate, there's sort of this knowledge loss if you've said, oh, this is, this is the future and nobody sees it that's out there. So it's, it's, a, it's a big task that's ahead of us, and I, I think it's something we can definitely uh, do, and I would reinforce what Tana said, is that foresight to what are gonna be the technologies that really we need to embrace and, and use. I, I can think of many practices I've been in and there's some technologies that are in closets and cupboards that at the time we thought these were gonna be the next big thing and they're, they're really, they're not. So a balancing act for all of us. Well, indeed, and of course, I mean, this kind of gets even to kind of the big hot topic. So of course, as uh, if people aren't necessarily aware um, about kind of the actual formal topic at EL, the ELC Oxford debate was uh, whether telehealth should be a core competency within DPT education. So I've got, of course, I know you guys are the con team, uh, but of course I've got to ask kind of overall, what are some reasons as to why you think it should not be a core competency, but also more importantly, kind of what are the challenges um, that are involved in making telehealth a core competency as it currently stands to kind of highlight um, what needs to happen on kind of a macro level and even kind of a micro level to kind of make um, a change like that happen in the future? So I'd like to start off with that by saying very clearly that the con team is not in any way against telehealth as a mode of delivery of care. Okay, the question which you so ably put is why do we think that it should not be at this point in time a core competency? And as Dave said uh, very clearly before is it's it's a matter of this, this positioning of all the material that needs to be taught and the importance of that material and determining what are the things that people need to know, absolutely have to know as an entry level practitioner. So if telehealth is the, the way in which a good percentage of people are practicing, then absolutely it needs to be a core competency. And then it needs to be tested on the exam that that tests for competence. So all of those things are need to be in place before an education program says, yes, this absolutely has to be a core competence. So um, looking at the analysis of practice, which FSBPT does annually, uh, you know, how much of the delivery of care is being done by, uh, by means of telehealth in the United States it hasn't risen to a level yet where it really needs to be considered to be part of the core competencies of education. However, all of the factors about care, which we do teach, that are necessary to transfer to being able to be effective in the telehealth space are taught. So it's not gonna be a hard shift to get us there when it is something that is part of a core competency. And I'll add, and I, I think really it's the timing of it right now, and again, as, as Nancy said there. We have the elements that are going to be there, and we also have to be careful that we're getting the students the, the, the right skills. So the one that stuck with me out of the debate was some of the uh, communication skills related to telemedicine. So one of the telehealth interactions can be a video interaction with your patient or client, and do you have the, the training and the skills to be able to look at someone in the correct way, whether on this video education session with you? How do you manage the, the background environment? How do you in, capture the technology that allows the broadband to keep you connected with your, your patient uh, if they have it? Beyond things that may already be happening in clinic, like yes, people text with their, their patients and they send emails to that, but I think we're looking at going beyond that uh, to be able to integrate the telerehabilitation aspect into our core curriculum. You know, I definitely see telehealth um, growing in the future. I mean, especially as we look at our students and their capabilities of the use of technology now and seeing how that will grow into the future is important. And thinking about, there's a lot of people doing some good work out there and having best practice models um, 
it, it, I believe is really important as we push forward and kind of look back at creating core competencies. Um, you know, being sure that we are looking at best practice and being sure variability, unwanted variation, um, is not part of this mode of, of care either. Yeah, and I'll jump back in. It's far, the, the, we, we identified four things. We, the four C's, we call them, in our, uh, our winning proposition there. And they were capacity, uh, competency, compliance, and, and cost. So uh, everybody can jump in here. But those are sort of some of the, the potential barriers that I think we need to overcome in the, the educational environment before this becomes that true core core competency. So from a cost standpoint, do we have the technologies that will deliver the telemedicine, telerehabilitation in our, in our programs, you know, uh, larger academic medical center based institutions may have that available to them now, but that's not the majority of uh, DPT programs that are out there. Do we actually have faculty that are skilled beyond Alan Lee and our great uh, pro team that were there that can come in and actually teach this to the level it needs to be uh, taught at to make it a, a competency uh, skills based. Uh, in Tana, in my world, from a clinical education standpoint, who do we send our students to so they can see this happening? Uh, so is, what's the capacity from a clinical education standpoint so that everybody gets exposed uh, to it? And then uh, maybe it'd be best if Nancy talked about compliance stuff. Well, you know, I just love to talk about compliance. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so obviously from the compliance aspect, you know, with 26 states part of the compact, but only 14 offering compact privileges at this time, we're pretty far from being able to, uh, you know, really cross borders as easily as we would like to. Uh, is that going to be different? Oh, yeah, that's going to be real different. Not too long in the future, but for right now, we have to be compliant with where we can practice and how we can practice. So looking at where the patient is, is really critical. Well, I think you brought, all brought up quite a lot of points. And I really love in the debate, you know, Dave, as you kind of had just referenced the four C's, because um, I think those are some really solid things that need to be considered. And of course, Nancy and Tana, everyone had kind of pretty much um, done a good job of kind of summarizing some of the current challenges. And uh, to briefly summarize, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like in the near future, it's probably going to happen when there's more data and some of these challenges are more overcome and you know the the land and things will change in a way that it'll be better able to happen but right now it's just not quite uh not all those pieces are aligning if that's if that's a somewhat accurate statement i think that that kind of characterizes where we're at at this point yeah and you know and of course you know mentioning of course all this avenue regarding telehealth of course as well um, before we kind of get into kind of the question that we usually ask everyone it's kind of our big hitter um, was there anything else you guys wanted to touch on regarding um, this avenue when it comes to telehealth as a core competency that perhaps um, we didn't chat about or we didn't discuss that you think would be relevant for people to hear or know about? You know, there's one thing that I, I would love to just kind of put out there and that as far as the, the major core competency and it has absolutely crosses every single practice dimension is if we can only give our students the, um, the wherewithal to understand that they own their practice and that it is their responsibility how they practice their entire career. And it doesn't really matter what setting it is and it doesn't matter who owns it. It matters how they practice uh, to the top of their license, to the top of their ability and that they maintain that ability all the time at the highest level. If we can instill that, all the other core competencies come in and go out as they need to because they understand that it's their ownership and their, and their belonging and their acceptance of their responsibility to move the profession forward. Yeah, Brandon, the one thing I would add is um, I think the consumer interest in this uh, is potentially going to drive a response from education, when that'll be, I, I don't really know. But if if the consumer in healthcare decides that this is now how they they want the relationship with their physical therapist as a provider is in a uh, electronic means versus an in-person means, then I think that may facilitate us getting closer or to pushing that that forward. And I think a lot of people 
me being one of them, we got into the profession because we like that, that interaction, that one-on-one, -on -one, that patient uh, connection. But those things might be changing going forward. And then the value that's placed on that telemedicine service delivery uh, from a compensation standpoint, if it becomes a viable service, we may see that uh, facilitating change in the clinic, which will drive us in education to be have our students potentially more prepared there. Yeah, and I think Dave makes makes a good point there, thinking about the end user in all of this and how things um, that those individuals and their needs and um, how they access care. We've already seen that drive um, the need and the growth in telehealth, and that potentially um, is going to go even further in physical therapy. As we're talking about some challenges relative to core competencies um, in telehealth, thinking about implementation on the PT side um, will have some of its challenges, as Dave mentioned, this, the C's with all of it that come, um, but also thinking the trickle effect um, that is involved with our PTA programs as well. So we, as all professional um, academic programs and in the profession itself, there's a lot that we need to consider from both of those uh, lenses. Yeah, and I, would, I and I think of, uh, I do think of Nancy, this from a regulatory standpoint when it comes to the, how are we supervising the uh, directing and supervising plans of care and, and the assistance when uh, potentially telemedicine is the primary service delivery model that's gonna go, uh, go on. And, and, and as I look at in our state, like many others, the, the ability to deliver care in rural areas is gonna become more important with that PT, PTA, PTA team. So I think PTA educators should definitely be included in this discussion and be considering how it can be incorporated into their curricula uh, as well as the PT ones. And it's a great point because it brings up, you know, what we've discussed many times is telehealth appropriate, right time, right patient, right place, right practitioner. So, you know, the supervision comes in there and, and the comfort for both the practitioner that's being supervised and the one doing the supervision. So good points. Privacy protection aspect of it. So if I'm in a central site working with a, a physical therapist assistant at a, at a distance uh, site and, you know, who's in the background of that video if we're both cons looking at this, this client and, you know, hopefully it's not happening at Starbucks or, somewhere else when we look at our HIPAA considerations uh, from there. And, and I think it'll take a while for us to really get those considerations out. Like these are the standards. You don't, you don't practice telemedicine at Starbucks uh, from there. You know, and if you're in someone's home, who's given the permission to be in that camera view because it is stored and forwarded at times. And I see it as well with the PT-PTA relationship as a real nice opportunity to strengthen partnerships with, you know, developing those core competencies and everything else in the future. So um, there's going to be a lot of fun ahead. No, I think you all make some really, really good points on that. And I appreciate those kind of those add-ins because I recognize that, you know, that those are some really important things that we need to discuss. But of course, you know, we have to, of course, ask our final question that we pretty much ask every single guest. Now, this does not have to be related to telehealth. This can be anything within entry level, post-professional, undergrad, whatever the case may be, any element of education, the sky's the limit on this question. So, so here's the big, here's the big question. Uh, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, uh, whether that be physical therapy or otherwise, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? I might, I'm going to start off on this if it's okay with you all. Um, you know, this is a, a really, and I'm not sure if the word change or may, maybe it is applicable in my, my thinking here, but I would love to see every healthcare environment, no matter what healthcare profession is, um, ingrained in there. Every healthcare environment embrace an educational model. Emphasize teaching, um, really creating an infrastructure of valuing teaching the next generation, because I think we have wonderful institutions all around that do that, and uh, I would love to see that happen oh, just all across every single practice setting and there's tons of barriers for it, but I would love to see all those barriers removed. 
I'll jump in here. I, uh, so first of all, it, there should be a much greater emphasis on uh, the care of older adults. That would be my bias yeah. across all across all programs. For actually some some significant uh, reasons there, but that that is that is my bias. If I had my my druthers in the big picture, we would become even more holistic uh, providers. And and by that I mean sort of really embracing the social determinants of health aspects. Um, from a PT standpoint, it's get out of the clinic and get into the community and be part of your community uh, from there. It's the, you know, it's, it's Nancy, I think, alluded to. It's that top of license practice, owning your practice uh, from the preventative aspects all the way to the consultative aspects. I think everybody can benefit from input in one way from us as a, a physical therapist. It's just how much uh, how much we provide. So it would be that, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a, a more public health associated vision for all healthcare providers to see that, that, bigger, that bigger picture. And so if we're going to put in our personal biases, I'd have to put in mine, of course, of uh, making sure that regardless of healthcare um, discipline anybody chooses, uh, that that they realize that it is a privilege uh, to be able to interact with another human being and be involved in in the care of another human being, so that they take that privilege, um, you know, and the responsibility that goes with it, and manage to always interact with people with as much integrity as they can. But I guess from my perspective, for for everybody, the value of of health, you know, the value of good health, and that we take the responsibility to help people understand what aspect PT brings to the value of good health and that um, we can really help people understand the value of physical therapy as a discipline. Uh, I think if we could, we could do that, we might even get some of our legislators to get on board with that as well and understand you know, that it, this is a, a valuable way in which to help people live their life to the fullest regardless of what type of other things and challenges they may have. Well, I really respect those answers. And if I may kind of dig, dig into those just a little bit, because I'd love to kind of hear from your guys' perspective um, from the academic side. And of course, speaking more from, you know, PT education on the didactic front. And I realize, of course, it's, you know, to have this impact, we're going to need didactic and clinical and the practice. I know they all need to kind of be on a similar page to make this effect more profound, but as you guys kind of see it more from the academic side, um, what are some things that you see would kind of need to happen to continue to move towards that path optimally? I think we need to continue with our uh, emphasis on the interprofessional education components of that. I, I think I, I go back to my, my training back in the, the early 90s that all my friends that were physicians were my friends at the time, and then I respected them and had the opportunity to work with them. So we, you know, we we were sort of raised together, and I think that helped us in practice with some shared experiences. So um, you get to go to the source as to what does a physical therapist do, and what does a, a family practice physician do, or whatever healthcare discipline uh, might be out there, uh, versus breaking up the silos. And I think the IPE that is coming along has some pretty great opportunities to put healthcare practitioners and students uh, together, as well as to get people in the community to see what they're doing. And I, and I think the way Nancy put it was great. Um, that value, that contribution that we have to the overall health of individuals and populations. That was well said, David. I, th I think I'd love to see um, us looking at our admissions process and the type of people that we're admitting into PT programs. Uh, sure, they have to be bright. We're really lucky that we have so many bright young people interested, uh, but not to not to underplay the importance of still having that passion for, for what you want to do, because uh, that takes you a long way. Yeah, and I agree both with David and Nancy. You know, thinking about admissions, I'm fortunate. You know, we have a, a lens of a little more holistic at the institution I am at, but that service mindset with strong integrity and ingrained in IPE, 
um, has the ability to really do some wonderful things, not just from a health and wellness standpoint and community outreach, outreach and, you know, meeting the demands of underserved populations, but really allowing those participating to have a better view, um, get out of their silos, really understand um, practice, understand all of the tools that we different disciplines bring to the table and all of that combined has some really we've seen it um, have a lot of um, strong impact in communities but also um, how um, how all of the the professions take that forward into a healthcare environment as well and I really appreciate you know your insight to this big question because this is a question of course we've gotten quite a quite a wide variety of responses to um, for obvious reasons and we've got quite a bit of variability on that um, but I also recognize that there might be some people that after they've listened to this topic or maybe also this episode combined with the pro teams episode, um, there might be some further questions. Um, where can people kind of reach out to each of you? Should they have a question on anything that was discussed or if there are any kind of um, helpful resources that you would direct people to, should they want to do further reading on kind of this avenue? I would recommend that people take a look at the um, digital white paper that uh, was done by um, Impetra. Uh, it's INPTRA and that website's easily, um, you know, accessible. And there's a digital white paper that is really uh, very good because our international uh, colleagues have been doing telehealth for a really long time. So they were really instrumental in putting that together. Uh, so I would suggest that they take a look at that. And I'm at Rutgers University and easy to find. Um, so it's just KirschNA at Rutgers.edu. So easy to find that way. Yeah, and I would add to that. So I'm uh, David. I'm at Taylor underscore DW at Mercer.edu. So I'm at Mercer University, or just you will see my my face without my tinky winky glasses on if you go to the faculty uh, webpage for our uh, for our department. I'd also encourage people to look at the APTA's uh, telemedicine telehealth resources. I think the paper that Nancy referenced is linked. Uh, there and they're doing a good job of keeping it up and anything Alan Lee has written <laughs> will clue you in on uh, good tele telehealth tele rehabilitation resources and yeah there's the, the resources that they just uh, let you know about there there's resources out there and as we prepared on our con side we did read a lot of other papers and research and, and things like that. So there's um, lots of avenues somebody can go um, to gather more information. And I am with AT Still University and can be found there at T Wilkinson at atsu.edu. Well, I appreciate that all. And then listeners, if you're, if you're wishing, of course, some of those links that the others had referenced are clearly down in the show notes. So feel free to either scroll down um, on your phone or your laptop or whatever medium you're viewing this from, and you'll, the links will be right there for your easy convenience to access. But I want to thank you all again so much for coming on today to share you know, insight on this topic. I know it's a big one, and it'll be very interesting to see kind of how it plays out over the next few years and see how everything will modify as a result. But uh, thank you so much for all that you do and for spending the time today. It's much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.